let me start this last part by correcting something. Um, I don't want to get into the technicalities about it too much, but it does bring up an interesting point. Um, it's not quite true to say that what we're really interested in is taking the integers and just adjoining the root of minus d. Uh, that has been true in the examples we've done so far. Uh, but for example, when d is 3, so if you're solving the problem x squared plus 3y squared equals a given number, um, then it's not quite true that you just take root minus 3 and then take integer combinations with that. Uh, it turns out that what you really should do is take this slightly more complicated guy. The heart of it is still definitely root minus 3, but you add, uh, you subtract 1 from it, and then you divide it by 2. And the divided by 2 is a little surprising because the whole point of the Gaussian integers seem to be that we really still live in the world of integers somehow, but we just use i's, and we're not allowing fractions, and we're certainly not allowing just arbitrary complex numbers, okay? So um, when d equals 3, and in fact, when these d's are, um, let's see, I think 2 and 3 mod 4, although I'd have to look it up, but I know it's, 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 this works for 3, um, you do this instead. And here, the naive explanation is this. Um, the main thing is to get something where you can, you bring root minus 3 into the picture, um, and you would like to get something that has unique factorization. It turns out that this does have unique factorization if you put in the over 2, not if you don't. Um, the big problem with putting in the over 2 is it it uh, is liable to produce what would be you could call runaway denominators. That in a lot of situations, if you start dividing by 2, you're going to end up having to divide by 4, by 8, by 16, by 32, by arbitrarily large powers of 2, and then you're not in at all the same situation as before. Turns out that in certain situations with certain values of d, this is perfectly legal and a really good idea, and it doesn't actually produce runaway denominators. So that's a naive explanation. It's, it's a good one as a first explanation. If I were continuing with uh, emulating David Pollock's lecture notes, that's exactly what I would tell you about. Um, a better explanation, though, and again, something that he mentioned in his lectures, is there's actually a, a much deeper issue, and that's you really need to figure out what the correct generalization of an integer is. So there's a certain relation between integers and rational numbers, and we kind of think we know what the, what the relationship is, but again, just like with the case of primes, we don't really know it until we look at these general contexts. And it turns out that uh, this, even though it has this divided by 2, acts more like the integers than if you didn't have the divide by 2, if you just took root minus 3 and took combinations of ordinary integers and integer multiples of root minus 3. Um, and so this is actually what's called the ring of integers in the number field q would adjoin root minus 3. And so in general, what, we, what I really should be saying is uh, instead of z adjoin root minus d, is the ring of integers in the number field q adjoin root minus d. And then we have to, we'd have to go into a whole discussion about what does this mean What's the correct generalization of the idea of an integer? It's a cool subject. Uh, it's very important to the, the development of the theory. Not what I wanted to talk about. Similarly, um, when I say z adjoin root d, with d as a positive number, um, and we don't use complexes, uh, it's really the same correction. We, I really should be saying the ring of integers in uh, a, what's called a number field. Okay. So um, I wanted to really close out, though, with a rather different case, another reason to care about unique factorization. It's a really important story um, in many cases, and it's really one of the big genesis's, genesis of algebraic number theory in the, say, the last half of the 19th century, um, and that's good old Fermat. Let's look at Fermat's last theorem, okay? Um, so just to make things work out a little bit nicer with the algebra, let me just reorder this. I'm just going to pull, push things over a little bit, and write it as c to the n minus a to the n equals b to the n. Okay. We'd like to show that this is impossible to have if a, b, and c are non-zero integers and n is greater than 2. Okay. So uh, let's look at n equals 4. Let's look at, uh, it's, this is basically going to be a, the start of a sketch of a proof of Fermat for n equals 4. Um, so if you look at c to the 4th minus a to the 4th equals b to the 4th, let's use this idea of factoring again. Hey, that factors. That's a difference of squares. c squared minus a squared, c squared plus a squared. If we use the... Um, Gaussian integers idea, then we can factor it all the way down to um, just uh, binomials, okay, and uh, just linear things in C and A. 
Okay, and I want to write this in a particular way. I'm going to bring this forward and push this back a little bit. This is, has a nice pattern. It's c plus a times all of the powers of i. i to the 0 is 1, of course. i squared is minus 1. i cubed is minus i. And so this has a very nice power, uh, a nice pattern. Okay, so suppose that you did have a solution to this in non-trivial integers, which we know is impossible, but this is what we're trying to prove here. Um, then we've got b to the fourth is a rather different looking product, okay? And this is rather like what we saw in uh, the previous videos, that we've got the same number factored in what certainly look like two very, very different ways. And that is suspicious, um, but it's only, it's b far more suspicious if we know unique factorization holds, okay? So this is, we're only using the Gaussian integers here, so this can be turned into a proof for n equals 4. Well, that's pretty old news, okay? That goes way, way back. And then the question is, can you do that in other contexts, okay? Here's the key to what happened with this. It wasn't so much difference of squares, it was the fact that i is a fourth root of 1. And it's a special kind of fourth root of 1. I mean, like, if I asked you what's a fourth root of 1, you could just answer, well, 1, because 1 to the fourth is 1. But that's not an interesting fourth root of 1 i is interesting because its powers give all the other roots. There are four fourth roots of 1, and they're exactly the powers of i. i, minus 1, minus i, and 1, okay? That's called a primitive root of unity. It's primitive fourth, fourth root of unity, okay? Now, it turns out, using complex numbers, um, for any n, you can find a complex number. It's often called zeta, uh, bringing in the Greek letters here, that's a primitive nth root of 1. So if, if n is 17, for example, then uh, zeta could be a primitive 17th root of 1. And if you're thinking I picked the 17 out of thin air and it's random, then I probably have to sh give you a video about how, why 17 is special. But if you look it up on Wikipedia, you'll probably figure out what I'm talking about. Anyway, um, if n happens to be odd, okay, let's look at odd, let's, let's assume n is an odd prime, for example. Um, that's really the only hard case of Fermat. Um, let's go back to the original one where it's a plus because it just works out better. Um, there's a nice factorization of a sum of nth powers using a primitive root of nth root of unity. Turns out to be very similar to what I had up here, where this was a, something that used minuses, but this is it's not a big big difference. It's a plus b, which is really zeta to the zero. Okay, so let's put that in. That's zeta to the zero, and then a plus zeta the one b, a plus zeta squared b, all the way up to zeta the n minus one. So that's uh, turns out to be a factorization that's always true of a to the n plus b to the n. Very cool fact. Lots of interesting consequences to that. And again, if you had a Fermat solution, which you're trying to show is impossible, that's equal to c to the n. So the left and right hand sides, again, factor these d numbers rather differently. Okay, once again, this can be turned with a certain amount of work. It can be turned a into a proof for Fermat for this value of n if z adjoin this nth root of unity has unique factorization. And this was really, this was thought to be a an honest-to-God proof of Fermat for all n, because people didn't realize that this might fail in these kinds of situations, okay? And, of course, we now, from the previous videos, we can see, well, huh, that, that would be pretty lucky if they all had unique factorization, and it's not true. That's why it took another 100-plus years to prove Fermat with very different techniques, and, in fact, this is why I picked out 23 as a particularly interesting number, another one where if you ask a number theorist, What's special about 23? They're pretty likely to say that's the smallest n for which uh, this kind of ring, this kind of algebraic structure, z adjoin a 23rd root of unity, does not have unique factorization. These are called cyclotomic, um, well, they're, they're part of the theory of cyclotomic fields. Again, there's a, a bit of an issue similar to the issue I started this video with. Okay, so 23 is another marker, I'd say, of going into more complicated terrain. Okay. So, where does, this, where does this lead, just to finish up? Um, we don't want to give up uh, at this point and just say the only way we know how to do any kind of mathematics is when unique factorization is true, okay? Um, you want to know what happens after, it's, after it fails. Um, there's, y there's a lot of uh, subtle analysis of how numbers can combine and factor in these situations. And I've said this word before, I've been trying almost... Um, painfully to avoid the terminology that these algebraic structures we're talking about, where you can do uh, addition and multiplication 
Um, in the same way you can do in the integers, these are called rings. And so z, adjo z adjoin zeta is an example of a ring, and the Gaussian integer is an example of a ring. And there's a lot, lot, lot to be said about these things. There is, in fact, a specific measurement uh, which you could say, how far away are we from having unique fra factorization? And it's a number, it's an integer, it's called the class number. Um, and class number one happens to have a very simple meaning, it means unique factorization holds. So what I've been, one way to talk about what I've been telling you, and a little bit about like these lists I had way up here, like this list, these are, this is a list of um, telling you which of these um, number fields have unique factorization, or in other words, have class number one. And so it's called the class number one problem to figure out exactly in all situations when do you get class number one. Um, the real, where this really leads is a very immense structure of algebraic number theory. Lots more depth to this than I was evil, even able to scratch the surface of. And for example, if you want a sexy application, of course, among many other things, and a lot of algebraic geometry as well, um, these ideas lead to the actual roof of proof of Fermat by Wiles and Taylor.